Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, the first of a, what promises to be a busy month and what a great way to cap it off with a uh, legendary Bill Holter joining us back for a repeat uh, uh, return to the site, and we're happy to have him as always. As you know, Bill has nearly 40 years of experience uh, as a financial advisor, the, the overall financial landscape, and in precious metals, gold, and bug expert excuse me, gold and silver bug expert. And uh, we're going to be querying him today, as always, on a number of subject matters regarding the financial industry and the society as a whole. Now, if you are new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow. And please do hit that customize button so you don't miss a minute of these important podcasts. Bill Holter, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being back again. And how are you doing today? I'm well. Thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure. Well, Bill, we'll start right out of the game. Waste no time, as always. Um, as you know, everything we see in here with the legacy media is fake, phony, and false. Just this last week, the quote by the administration labor market backtracked on their unemployment numbers that they reported initially 818,000 fewer jobs than reported uh, ended in, ending in March. Um, I believe the actual number, according to the Kobisi letter on X, is somewhere closer in the range of 1.2 million uh, jobs lost. Um, you watch this data regularly, obviously. In your estimation, what are the real unemployment numbers that the public is not being told? Um, I, I'm going to say that's above my pay grade to actually crunch those numbers. Uh, okay. But I would say uh, John Williams, the last I saw uh, from John Williams' shadow stats, um, and he's you know, a true bean counter and counts the way uh, these statistics were done back in the early 1980s before they started changing them. And I think he's come up or has come up with the uh, last I saw was 17% unemployment. I just saw an article today that there's 450,000 Americans uh, that have two full-time jobs. And that's the highest ever. Um, it's, I mean, it's clear that you know, the unemployment numbers are bogus. The inflation numbers are bogus. GDP numbers are bogus. Uh, I mean, pretty much all the numbers that we get to make a calculation to try to make a, uh, you know, a qualified investment stance, they're all, they're all bad numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, on your suggestion, I went to his page and did a little digging and yeah, from what we can ascertain, Bill, it looks to be somewhere in the range of, like you said, between 17 and 20 percent, which is obviously much more significant than what we're being told. Speaking of suppression, uh, which is a good segue, I think, Bill, is we know the housing market numbers are being fudged as well. A good example is the blue states are seeing the bloodletting, particularly in the commercial and residential markets, but it hasn't quite hit yet with as much force with the red states. Um, what do you imagine the attrition rate for the real estate market will ultimately be by the end of the year going into 2025? And when do you see the whole of the country kind of realizing the impact on those markets? Well, first off, I think you're, the difference between the red states and the blue states, a lot of that has to do with regulations. Um, and a lot of that, we just look at California, people are moving out. So they're leaving houses on the market for sale. So that kind of explains you know, your difference between the red states and blue states. Um, the commercial market and the housing market are two different animals. And I mean, you're, you've are you seen uh, you know, high rise office buildings selling for 15%, 10%, even 5% of what they were appraised at just three, four, five years ago. So, I mean, that market is a debacle and you're, you're probably talking about a trillion dollar market. Somebody's gonna eat those losses. Those are losses uh, that are in the system. You know, just because the owners turn the keys back to the lender and, you know, they lose their equity. Not only that, uh, the value of these properties are in many cases below what the loans were. So somebody's gonna eat those losses. Um, in the housing market itself, I just saw a chart, uh, I think three or four days ago, showing the the pricing of housing today versus the house pricing of housing relative to incomes in 1971. And I think the 
crux of the article was that's the last time we're on the gold standard. And mm -hmm. what's happened since then is that, you know, credit has been very easy to get. It's gone into the, into uh, assets of all types. And obviously housing uh, is an asset. And what's happened is I think the number has gone from something like 70% uh, to 172% as far as the, um, the ability for for the average American to buy a house. The average American today cannot buy a house and inventories are starting to, to build. They're starting to pile up. So, I mean, I can't tell you, you know, where it's going to be by the end of the year. It may be that everything by the end of the year shut down, you know, whether or not we have an election, uh, whether we have some type of false flag to, to, to pause or cancel the election. I mean, I have no idea if markets are even going to be open by the end of the year, but Judging by um, you know the overall landscape, asset prices or asset values by the end of the year should be much lower than they are now. Absolutely, and to your point, Bill, I'm, I'm thank you for saying that because there was a gentleman I saw on a podcast recently talking. I think it was last weekend talking about in Florida where he's located. There's ten major cities in, in what's known widely as a red state, obviously in Florida, where they're seeing. 40 to 50% attrition, houses just sitting, like you said, inventories piling up. You see inventory piling up with the, the repo market with cars, as an example. So it's, it's, it's hitting all these different, as you know, industries. I also saw, I think it was a little over a month ago, we reported on our Telegram, somebody sold a property in New York for 97% off. So it's just, it's staggering the things we're seeing in these unprecedented times to illustrate your point. Um, now, Bill, you're really good at tackling the... Please. Yeah, let me just add to that. Um, sure. It also, uh, recent news, and this has been happening now for a year, two years uh, since that since that condo collapsed in South Florida. Um, homeowner association fees have gone through the roof since that point, and many people now their home their HOA fees are actually more mm -hmm. than what the mortgage itself is. So you've got people that are, are bailing out because they simply can't afford, they can't afford to stay. And it, I mean, it yeah. may even be out of place that they own outright, have no debt on it, but the HOA fees are more than what people can pay. So, I mean, there's, there's another part of the housing market that's, that's crumbling. Absolutely. And then just to add to what you're saying, but also the insurance aspect as well, if people are just foregoing, for uh, foreclosing on insurance because they can't afford to do that if they can't afford the HOA fee. So you have this sort of compounding effect. Um, but thank you for adding that. Um, as always, Bill, you're really good at tackling the tough, honest issues that not many are willing to face, which is one of the many reasons we love having you. And a prime example is the elephant in the room. I'm referring to you know, 401ks, pensions, IRAs, which is essentially phony paper wealth. Um, a lot of people are sort of banking on that and are not you know, moving into the gold and silver positions that we obviously, as part of becoming your own central bank, recommend they do. When do you imagine those false instruments of wealth will be brought down and people have to kind of face the music that those are no longer solvent? Uh, you're you're kind of asking me, you know, when is the when is the equity market going to crash? And there, that's the answer to your question. And you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you when. Sure. But you, you can pretty much. You can pretty much know that that 401ks are going to going to be decimated when markets get decimated, and as far as pension plans are concerned, uh, this has been an ongoing problem for uh, I'm going to say 10 years back in 2000 what 13 14 15 when they first started to zero out interest rates. The problem is that uh, defined benefit plans had to take more and more risk to get the type of returns that they needed from an actuary standpoint. And I mean, when you zero, zero out interest rates, it used to be that, that these, these pensions could put their funds into treasuries and earn enough from an actuarial standpoint to make the payments out, you know, basically forever. But at this point, the math no longer works because the, the pension plans, like I said, have had to take more and more risk, get away from treasuries, uh, go down the line as far as 
you know, from double A, uh, single A, triple B, you know, some of these pension plans are are buying uh, the the worst credit that they're allowed to put on the books just to get any type of yield. And on top of that, those yields are not high enough. So, you know, they're overweighting in equity. So when the equity market cracks, it's completely game over. And I've mm. said this for a while from a societal standpoint. Um, to this point, people have been somewhat polite. But once the markets, people have been polite because they look at their 401k statements, they look at the value of their homes, they look at the value of their assets, and they're like, well, yeah, that's really, you know, some bad stuff. But it doesn't really affect me. I'm okay because I've got this 401k, my house, these assets. Once that cracks, once the asset values really take a hit, you're going to see the politeness go away. And that's when you're going to see, uh, you know, societal, if you want to call it, uh, approaching Mad Max. That's where we're headed. Totally, totally. And maybe this, I know you don't have a crystal ball, obviously, but we can look to historical replication for things like 2008, which obviously, you know, what's coming and or what's at our doorstep now is global. So that's on steroids, to say the least. But Here's, I think, a potentially good transition question, Bill, to add to what you were saying. Um, what might be an indicator, I want to see what you think about this, is we have Fed Chair Powell uh, signaling the first of many rate cuts starting September 18th. I believe it's going to be somewhere in the 50 basis point range. And they're talking about also, I believe, November and December. Uh, do you imagine when they first start that rate cut in, in September and then continuing on into the year, wouldn't that suggest a major drop in the dollar index, possibly even maybe a combination of the Fibonacci and Cantillion effect? Well, I think you've already started to see, you know, the dollars come down from the 105, 106 uh, level to 101 and change. Mm -hmm. And that's versus foreign currencies. Um, you could look at the price of gold. And I mean, you know, we're $2,500 an ounce and you go back to, uh, October of last year, we were $1,700. That started from the day after the U.S. announced that they were sequestering a $300 billion uh, Russian funds. Because I think the rest of the world looked at that and said, hey, if they can do that to Russia, they can do that to us. As far as the uh, whatever date you said, September 18th, when the Fed mm -hmm. meets, yeah, they will... I would imagine they will certainly cut rates. It'll be a quarter point or a half a point. Um, I would say if it's a half a point, then the the action that you could see uh, would be an outside day. The initial knee jerk would be to the upside with equities, and it would not surprise me to see that mark a top in the markets because markets will view the Fed as panicking. In other words, they're being forced to cut rates. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, going counterintuitive to what their agenda was, like you said. Um, you know, another person that we have, Greg, who's a subject matter expert like yourself, uh, Greg Manorino, he mentioned on a recent podcast, he believes gold is going to hit somewhere between eight to 10,000 by the end of the year and somewhere between 800 to 1,000 on silver before year's end. I was curious to see if you agree with this assessment or if you see it differently. And if so, why? Well, I have no idea uh, timing wise, but yeah, that certainly could happen. I mean, you have a panic in the dollar. If you have a panic in markets, if you have a panic in markets and they close, uh, how would you even know that gold is eight or ten thousand dollars an ounce? Yeah, I mean, overseas you could you could still have markets open and trading, but I don't think you can put a price on gold or on silver uh, because when when markets break, that means the Western manipulation is done. It's over with. Mm -hmm. And I mean, who knows what the number could be? I mean, he could be off by a zero. Meaning, you know, it could be 80 to 100,000 for gold and it could be, uh, you know, it could be at a zero to the silver price. I mean, who knows? It's, uh, th there are so many uh, paper contracts oversold versus the gold and silver that they have for delivery. If there's a failure to delivery, you know, what is the value of a contract 
that cannot perform? And the answer is zero. Mm -hmm. So what's the what is the opposite of zero? It's infinity. infinity. So I mean, there's there's yeah, there's no way to really put a price on it. Um, but yeah, I think we'll be strong going into the end of the year. Uh, if we don't have an election, uh, you could you know definitely see big numbers. But I'm not willing to give you a number because I think anybody that gives you a number is making the number up. I mean, it's pure speculation. Sure. Okay. That's why I wanted to engage you on that. It's interesting too, Bill, because I just saw a podcast of a gentleman. I don't know if you've heard of him, Alex Collier, and he's kind of backing up your assertion that the real uh, debt that we have all in in America is somewhere around 263 trillion. And I know you had said between two to 300 trillion in previous podcasts, um, just as a memory reminder. And so that would substantiate your point about gold and silver having to be in six figures to cover that debt if that were to happen. So just interesting, the parallels. Yeah, if you do, and I did the math, and this was probably three years ago, and I think we mm -hmm. were, I forget whether we were at 23 trillion or 27 trillion. I, I need to go back and redo the math, and it's easy to do. You just take the 262 million ounces that the U.S. supposedly has of gold, not been audited since the 1950s, so probably that number's you know, way, way, way high. Mm -hmm. But if you take that number and you divided it into just the on books debt, the number I came up with was $125,000 an ounce to pay off just the on books debt. So uh, if if the actual uh, debt instead of 35 trillion is 250 trillion, you have to add, uh, you know, almost, I'm not, yeah, almost another zero onto the price of gold just to do that math hmm. now the reason you and i've said this for at least 10 years that no one can forecast the price of gold because a we don't you don't have a numerator and you don't have the denominator we don't know how much gold the u.s truly holds a mm -hmm. and b we have no idea how much debt and how much new money supply the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are going to have to create to keep this, you know, keep this circus running. So you don't have a numerator, you don't have a, a denominator, you really can't come up with a number. But just understand the number's huge. And it's that number is higher than any number that anybody's forecast. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, another good transition, I think, Bill, is we have, we've talked about this, obviously, in many podcasts, that uh, gold and silver absolutes to have, but what about um, your opinion on copper, rhodium, platinum, palladium? Do you think those minerals would be a nice accompaniment for people to have for the average person to balance against gold and silver? No, they're not precious metals, they're industrial metals. And when the system comes down, so is the real economy. The real economy itself is going to, to fail, sputter, stop. Uh, so the demand for industrial metals is going to going to fall off a cliff hmm. at the same time the demand for precious metals because they are money because they're money you're going to have capital fleeing the paper markets and moving into gold and silver not into copper not into rhodium not into palladium platinum um, i mean think about you know palladium platinum uh how much of it's used for for instance catalytic converters um i mean that demand is is going to be gone so your demand side of the industrial metals is going to collapse. At the same time, your demand for precious metals is going to explode. So it's kind of an inverse process, basically. Well, it normally is not, but because this is truly the end of this of the fiat experiment, end of the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is inverse. It's absolutely inverse. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Bill, we have a brewing situation, as you probably know, concerning shipping containers and ocean crisis delivery on our doorstep with the Strait of Hormuz potentially being blocked off, which brings about increased presence of U.S. warships in the Middle East. Does this mean a signal of hyperinflation and sharply increasing the lack of ability of imported goods? And if so, what does that do to the price of oil here stateside? Um, I'm not sure what it would do to the price of oil here stateside because I mean, we certainly, and, and during the Trump years, we certainly can produce 100% of the oil necessary 
to run this country. Um, what I think is more pertinent is uh, other forms of shipping. And uh, when I say other forms of shipping, I mean, you've, been, you've got shipping from Asia to the U.S. And, and vice versa, not so much from the U.S. that direction, but uh, what a what a, a shipping crisis will do is it means that goods will not show up on store shelves, for example. So if those goods are not available, the pricing for whatever the you know whatever goods you could find are available, the prices are going to go much higher. So yeah, to answer your question, yes, it's a on one hand it's a hyperinflationary event because the the, the supply is not there, uh, but it's also a deflationary event from the standpoint to think about all the debt that that these uh, that these shipping firms and and firms that produce have. So that's debt that's going to fail. So you've got you know you have on one hand the the price of the good is going to go higher. So from a consumer standpoint, you've got hyperinflation, but from a systemic standpoint. You've got deflation because the debt is defaulting. And it, it goes back to, and I've said this also for years, that we would see hyperinflation of the things we need and hyperdeflation of the things we have. In other hmm. words, hyperinflation of, of you know, food, uh, soap, whatever, the, the stuff you need on a daily basis yet your assets are going to be crashing in value. So you've got inflation. You've got inflation and deflation at the same time. And to go a little further down the rabbit hole, the deflation itself undermines the currencies because all these currencies are built upon debt. And the deflation of the debt is basically just going to destroy the fiat currencies themselves. It will destroy their purchasing power. So, you know, within the system itself, you've got inflation and deflation. It's the worst of, of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a colliding right to the metal, to your point. Um, right. So last, last question for today, Bill, because I want to respect your time. Um, and this seems like a good segue as well. It's on the backs of what you just shared. As you know, next month, I believe it's October 22nd, the BRICS conference is being hosted by President Putin, I think in Kazan, outside of Moscow. Right now, as we can tell, it looks as that movement is mounting significantly. It looks like there's between 156 to 165 countries uh, that are set to join, including the Palestinian Authority. Um, that accounts for over 80 percent of the world's global population. As you said in a previous podcast with me, the whole goal of BRICS is to have real time asset settlements, something real for something real. Does next month's event signal to you that the BRICS summit in October is an inevitable formality to signal the end of the world's dollar hegemony? Um, it very well could. I mean, I'm not privy to, to you know, what their final decision, final timeline is. I mean, the end of that meeting could be a huge boom. When I say boom, I'm talking about an explosion like a bust. Uh, the Western world's financial financial markets, uh, real economies, fiat currencies, etc. Uh, I mean, if, if the BRICS, if they decide that they want to step up and displace the dollar and use, I think they're calling it the unit, if they decide that they want to use the unit in place of the dollar for, like you said, 80% of the world, that's the end of the dollar. And I mean, think about this. Going back to 1973 with the petrodollar, you know, that was a scheme basically to create artificial demand to prop up the dollar, and it allowed the United States to borrow unlimited amounts of funds. Mm -hmm. If the dollar gets supplanted as the trade settlement currency, then who's going to step up and buy our treasury bonds? And the answer is the Federal Reserve, which is uh, hand in hand now they've merged with the treasury so it is direct and outright in your face monetization and we've seen that many times throughout history and that is the end of a currency so 
I don't know if 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 it's going to be this meeting, but it will be a meeting somewhere in the not too distant future where they say that's it, we're done, we're not using the dollar anymore, and that's game over. Mm -hmm. But just to be clear, if they do say, like you said, this is it this year, then we should definitely see. I would think fair to say the bust up of the end of the market, correct? Well, yeah, you're I, the the date. I think you're right. is is October twenty second. Mm -hmm. And that would give us uh, not quite two full weeks until election day. Right. If if the BRICS were to step up and say, that's it, we're done, we're using the unit, we're no longer using the dollar. I mean, I would question whether markets would even be open by the time election came around. And, you know, that could be the black swan that creates the condition where they say, well, the election's postponed or the election's canceled or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, I mean, I I could envision for more reasons than I can count that something, some type of event, whether it be real or man-made false flag mm -hmm. that comes out before the election so that we don't have an election because, as I've said, if those who are in power now believe that they're not going to be able to cheat enough to, to win and retain power, they're going to kick the table over. There will not be an election. And I think the odds now are probably, in my mind, probably only 30 or 35 percent chance, so call it one out of three chance, that we even have an election. But we'll see. I mean, we'll find out soon. It's only 60 days away or thereabouts. Yeah, yeah, we're we're hitting the precipice now. Absolutely. Well, as always, Bill, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for being back on the podcast. Um, Bill, where can people find your work and any last thoughts you have for the audience today? Um, yeah, you can go to my website. Uh, if you've got questions or whatever, you there is a contact button uh, with my email address. If you want to go directly to my business email address, that's uh, b bolter at proton me, and it seems like I'm I'm ending all of my interviews now would just do the best you can. I mean, this is imminent. And once this, once it does arrive and you find out there's holes in your plan, don't beat yourself up. Just do the best you can between now and whenever that, that happens. Yeah. And again, folks, remember that uh, Bill is part of the Miles Franklin family as are we as an affiliate partnership, uh, as we work with, as you know, Andy Sheckman and Bill is part of that. Uh, group. So if you do have interest in getting precious metals or converting a 401k IRA, whatever, maybe a combination thereof, Bill is definitely a viable source within the Miles Franklin family to work with. You can contact him directly and mention that, uh, mention my name that he's been on the podcast and um, obviously he'll take care of you regardless. That'll just add to it and he'll help steer you in any direction that you feel inclined. Bill, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it. We look forward to maybe having you on a couple more times before we see what we see and and uh, have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks, John. Thanks.